In the workshop, this is all about making a mounting base for a Castle Steam V6 coal-fired boiler, and this is part one. I went up to Blackgate's Engineering to find a suitable piece of thick metal to mount the boiler on. In the corner of the shop part of Blackgate's Engineering were a couple of steel discs on the floor, and they would have been fine, but I needed to have something with a large hole in the middle. Machining a steel disc would have been the cheapest option, but to do that you would need quite a substantial large lathe. So thinking about the viewers watching this, who probably do not have a machine large enough to turn an 8 inch diamond to steel disc, for the purposes of the video I bought this instead. This is a substantial casting with a hole in the middle, and this is actually a 66 tooth blank gear casting for a Durham and North Yorkshire traction engine, and it's made from cast iron. This is not a cheap item, prices at foundries these days are quite expensive. But with the help of a couple of kind viewers who arranged some gift vouchers with Blackgate's engineering, it made the part more affordable. And to the two kind viewers, I would just like to say, you know who you are and I thank you very much. But before I start the machining, you may find this part interesting. This is the beautiful Castle Steam boiler that I'm making the base for. And here's the piping arrangement in the top. This boiler has been very well thought out. It has a superheater and the two pipes from the wet header feed the steam into a central superheater that goes all the way down the central tube into the fire. The wet header is the part that takes the steam from the boiler and feeds it to the superheater, and in this case it's the fitting to the right of the picture with three bolts in it. The coil at the top of the boiler is not a steam dryer. This is a water feed preheater. A really well thought out design feature of the V6 boiler is the feed water delivery arrangement. The preheater feed goes all the way down through the boiler and delivers the water to the top of the firebox where it's really hot. And as this water is warm to start with because of the coil over the top of the fire tubes, then it shouldn't drop the pressure much at all. As soon as I've finished this mounting base, I intend to do a coal fired test of the boiler. But first of all, I'll fit a hand operated boiler feed pump. Normally, for a coal fired boiler, you are required to have two methods of putting feed water into the boiler. One is the hand pump, and in my case, the other one's going to be an injector. But for this first test, and owing to the good design of the V6 boiler, whereby the boiler can be lifted off the fire if you get a problem, then it will be fine with just a hand pump for starters. But first of all, I need a suitable mounting base, because at the moment, this ash pan, complete with this grate, is sat on a piece of wood. And that would be perfectly fine if I was going to gas fire the boiler. I've already made a video about the gas fired test of the boiler, but for a coal fired test, this ash pan needs to sit on a substantial piece of metal. So here is that substantial piece of metal in my forge or self centering chuck in the larger of my two lathes. What I'm currently doing is using a soft faced hammer to tap it into position to make sure it's sitting very square to the chuck jaws. Because this is a rough casting, it's not running very true, but it's not a precision item, and I don't have any real dimensions to work to. As long as the ash pan fits on this, then that's fine. Currently, this image is running at normal speed, but not for long, I'm going to speed it up. That's much better, it's now running at 2000% faster than it was, and you can see the tool actually cutting the metal. I'm using a round nose tool, mounted in the tool post at 90 degrees to the work. And this is another round nose tool, mounted in line with the work, and I'm using this tool to take a rough cut on the outside edge. The work is running slightly eccentrically because the hole in the middle really wasn't exactly in the middle. And there are different ways of doing this job. If it was a precision item, I would not do it this way. And the reason that I've done it back to front is not just my incompetence or incontinence. It's so that I can illustrate the fact that even if you have a very small lathe, you could use the external jaws of your three jaw chuck and grip the internal dimension and then profile the outside entirely this way you would have to leave the inside part a bit rough, but that isn't a problem, because after all, this is only a support for an ash pan. And once the ash pan is bolted to this support, no one is ever going to see underneath the ash pan. Why did I select a piece of metal with a great big hole in the middle? Well, that's quite simple. The ashes will fall from the fire through the fire bars into the ash pan. But the ashes immediately underneath the grate in the center part of the ash pan will be very hot indeed. And that is the logic for getting a piece of metal with a large hole in the middle. The heat from the hot ashes sat in the middle of the ash pan will not be directly conducted to the main metal base plate. And the wooden board that the mounting base is going to be screwed to shouldn't get burnt. 
After cleaning up the outside edge, I reversed the part in the chuck, so although this looks just like the first bit of this sequence, it isn't, it's the other side. In exactly the same way that I turned the first side, I'm turning the second side. In this clip, I'm showing the futility of trying to turn the inside diameter. I cannot cut the inside dimension very much at all because the chuck jaws are in the way. So now I'm going to use the other set of jaws that I have for this chuck, the outside jaws. All I have to do is rotate the chuck key in an anti-clockwise direction and remove all the jaws. Then one at a time, starting off with the part of the chuck body that is marked with a 1, I refit the jaws in numerical order 1 to 4, and before fitting each jaw, I turn the chuck key approximately two turns in a clockwise direction to make sure that the jaws are engaged. I'm just making sure that all the jaws are in the correct position by winding the chuck key handle until the jaws are level with the outside of the chuck, then I rotate the chuck to make sure they're all in the same place. By holding one of the machine surfaces against the chuck jaws, I use the soft hammer to tap it firmly into place, and you can tell by the sound of the hammer on each of the four chuck jaws when the piece of metal is firmly sat up against the jaw. If it makes a ringing noise, it's not. And so now, using a boring tool, I can bore all the way through the centre. Generally speaking, when I use a boring tool, I go all the way through the work to get it to the final size that I need, and I usually set the auto traverse for starters to quite a fast speed. Then once I've got through the work successfully, and everything's looking good, then I stop the lathe, select a slower traverse, and reverse the direction of the traverse so that the lathe tool comes away and out of the work. But during this process, I do not touch the cross slide hand wheel, which effectively takes a very fine cut, and usually the rearward face inside of the carbide tip is still quite sharp so then I get a very good finish. With the inside ring turned to the correct diameter, all I need to do now is machine the front face of the ring, and to do this I'm using the same round nose tool that I used before. Then the final job really is to just turn the ring the other way around in the chuck and tap it into position with the soft hammer. Then for the final time, using the round nose tool, I face the other side. How thick is this? I don't really know. I would think it's about 5 eighths of an inch. This is definitely not a precision item, so I'm not going to waste time using a micrometer. I'm just using my eye. When it looks right, it is right. A quick tip here. As you can see, the cross slide is very close to the front of this work. So before you start these jobs, wind out the cross slide a little bit more than normal. I'm going to clean up the outside. I don't really know why I'm doing this. I'm just showing you that if you speed up the work, you do get a better finish. But if you speed up the work too much, you can get a really odd glazed finish. Whichever finish you choose though, it's better than this. This is the raw casting, and now, this is the raw casting with the ash pan on top of it. I turned the outer diameter of the cast iron ring to 8 and 5 eighths of an inch, and the inside of it to 5 and 5 eighths of an inch. I wrote the dimensions of the ash pan on the underside of the ash pan, which seemed like a good idea. 7 and 5 eighths by 7 and 7 eighths. And here is the ash pan, just been removed from the finished mounting base. The ash pan needs drilling to mount it to the mounting base, and the mounting base in turn also needs drilling to mount it to the wooden base on which it's all going. So here's the story so far, a really good solid cast iron mounting base with a hollow center to prevent heat transmission through the ash pan. And that's it for part one. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.